Thank you for coming to the meetup, Silicon Valley uh, Big Data Meetup. Uh, actually, it's a Silicon Valley MySQL meetup, and um, we sometimes talk about big data, sometimes we talk about MySQL, sometimes we talk about um, uh, hardware in this case. Hardware. So, <clears throat> yeah, with the software. So thank you for coming, and for those of you who are online, um, we're here at uh, Intel's uh, SC9 Auditorium, and um, I'm just going to do a quick introduction um, to Frank and uh, the topic, but uh, first I've got some housekeeping items. So very quickly, um, if you want to flip to the next slide. So Redis Conference is coming up, Redis Conf 2018, it's in San Francisco, uh, April um, what 25th and 26th, and we have a free promo code for those of you who are um, here and those of you who are online, you can go to redisconf.com and you can register using SV Big Data as the promo code, and that will give you a free pass. So um, Redis Conference San Francisco at Pier 27 in April. So hopefully you'll check that out. And um, next slide. And of course we've got Wi-Fi here. So if you want to connect to the guest network, you can get the uh, access code here and get going. And um, all right, so just a very quick introduction. So some of you know I worked at Intel for a little while and I got to know uh, Frank um, and also got to know him through Redis Labs, which is where I work now. And there's a lot going on in, um, in memory, in memory databases and in other um, uh, uh, databases that need to talk to disk of some sort, and what we're seeing is lots and lots of growth in um, SSD usage. So this topic should be interested, interest to anybody who's using uh, databases, um, especially once you get to scale, it starts to make a big difference. So we're seeing companies who are literally running you know, terabytes of data um, in memory, and you can't do that on one machine, so SSDs are how you get around that. You can scale out quite a bit that way. And uh, I think there's um, um, just a tremendous amount of growth going on there. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Frank. I'm Frank Ober, I'm a solutions architect. I've primarily worked, I've worked for five years on non-volatile memory at Intel. Um, the last couple of years I've worked on Optane SSDs. So what are Optane SSDs? It's a marketing term, right? What it is, it's a new brand of memory, right? We, we're in the non-volatile memory business, so we don't make DRAM, but we make non-volatile memory. Almost all the makers out there that make SSDs make NAND-based memory, that's high capacity uh, memory. And we're making a new type of memory, right? It's 3D crosspoint is the memory media. You've probably heard that. We've talked for a number of years about that. And now we have Optane SSDs. And Optane, Intel Optane SSDs are that memory, so it's 3D cross-point based. Our own in-house controllers, because this is a very strategic uh, product for us, so we um, make the controllers in-house. And then we also uh, do software, software libraries, um, partnering with software. We partner with guys like Redis Labs, which is um, an up-and-coming database type. But tonight what we're going to talk about is probably the most deployed cloud database in the world today. And those are the variants of MySQL, right? There's Oracle's behind MySQL through their acquisition with Sun. There's Percona and MariaDB. Um, what I'm using tonight is the Oracle community server. We're trying to make this very hands-on. We're trying to you know, make this um, you know, community-based. Please stop us anytime with a question. And I will try to uh, def decipher uh, any acronyms or anything weird on, uh, on what I'm saying. So. We want you to get the most out of MySQL, and things have changed, right? I think if you remember back, if you have a high-performance MySQL instance, what was the recommendation uh, from way back? It was put about 75% of your working set as DRAM. Tonight, we're going to flip that coin a little bit for you, and we're, we're going to tell you that, you know what? You don't need to use as much DRAM as you did before. And that the reason is, is the storage engine, that backing store, can be very high performance. It's denser, it's cheaper, and it's low latency enough, right? It's not at the same performance level of, as DRAM,
But most of these applications, the people I work with in the software solutions group here at Intel, show us that you know, a typical Intel server can have over 100 gigabytes per second of bandwidth, but MySQL cannot push hundreds of gigabytes per server in bandwidth. It's more like around 20 gigabytes per second of total bandwidth. And that's with a very expensive server with the top of the line platinum uh, CPU in there, which you know, a, a, an elite class of, of user buys. So that's one of the key things to, to learn today. We're going to talk about the tools. The most common tool that's used in MySQL is the Sysbench tool. It's uh, actively uh, worked on by Alexi, uh, who used to work for Percona for a long time. He may still work there, I'm not sure. Um, and we're using current MySQL, the one that's downloadable today. It's a production version. We don't want to like show you something that you can't get or something that's you know, not readily available in production yet. But I will talk a little bit about MySQL 8. And we're using the OLTP uh, benchmark, which is uh, write heavy, right? It's 70-30. That's considered a write heavy benchmark. Uh, these Optane SSDs, uh, their key attribute is very low latency reads, because reads are, can be direct, right? The, re, the low latency random reads is very critical in an SSD. And w servicing that at high rights is what's so critical. That's where a NAND SSD will not perform very well. You could do an all read uh, server and get a million transactions per second out of a two socket Intel server that we're shipping today. But as soon as you crank up that write volume, you're not going to get that million transactions per second anymore from a NAND based SSD. But you can from Optane. So, and we're going we're gonna to show you just standard MySQL, nothing too, uh, too fancy. After I show my demo on bare metal, we have Justin Elko sitting here in the front row. He created really nicely in the last couple of weeks um, a hands-on demo. So hands-on exercise. You can just do it yourself. It's a, a Docker container that's got my, the latest MySQL 5.7 and, and Sysbench uh, 1.0 in there. And just kind of show you the business value behind why you probably want to reconsider the mix of DRAM to SSD. And then Andrew Ruffin's going to come up. He's in the back right there. And he's going to talk about where is Optane? Where can you get access to Optane today? And you know, we can take your questions about you know, some of the things we're doing with them once we get off camera. All right, let's get going. Um, you know, Everybody knows that they have to use their CPU, right? If you don't use your CPU, you're not leveraging the asset you bought. Right? You spent money on a server or you spent money on a, on a machine in the cloud. If you're not using the RAM and the CPU that you have, you're wasting your money. It's not so simple, right? There could be software bottlenecks, locks, contentions going on. We're not going to go deep on any of that today. What I want to do is show you the concepts, right? When you look at CPU usage, you look at these, these vectors, right? The app is the user percentage. In a perfect world, all of your time on the CPU would be that user time, right? It's not that easy, though. You don't get everything in user time. And you're going to see this in the demo, right? It's like getting that user time up to 90% is elusive. It's not going to happen. There's system time that the kernel is doing for you, um, managing the IOs, managing the network, managing any hardware you're using. Things like FPGAs and, and GPUs are very popular today, and they're going to increase uh, like a hockey stick. And Intel's involved there, and we have a strategy. But today, it's about very high-speed storage <clears throat> and how that can complement DRAM. So there's the system time, right? And you want to lower that. And then there's this real nasty yellow thing here, the IO weight. You want the IO weight as low as possible. In fact, you want it at zero, right? Because all the time the CPU is waiting for a block from the storage device is waste. It's all 100% waste, right? So there are systems where IO weight is in proportion as big as you see here, right? I mean, I grew up in a time where people put hundreds of hard drives on an Oracle database because they needed to span out and get as much of this parallelism across all these slow hard drives. Now I'm in a, a development world and helping uh, customers say, hey, give me one high-powered SSD on the box. And I will use that very judiciously to increase the business value and what, you know, what I'm doing with that server. So it's flipped, right? From hundreds of devices, just give me one or a couple, one per socket. Right? 
idle, right? Idle is always there. You obviously have to want to size a system for about two times your peak load. I mean, that's the standard thing that I've done in my performance benchmarking. You know, you've got 40,000 users in an enterprise or whatever. You find out how, how many users come at any one time when the CEO says, go to the site. I just posted, you know, your, your, your bonus results. That's always the peak time for people like, oh, my bonus. I better go to the site I never go to. And, and check and you know you get a lot of traffic and you better be sized for that for that load because people are actually double clicking because it's taking uh, 10 seconds instead of the normal two to get in there and so um, you know these are the things you got to watch out for so you got to have some idle in, or some way in the cloud to elastically scale so these are the things a little um, nuances here is you're often waiting on the network right across the four key resources in the system the CPU, the memory, the storage, the network is really the slowest. On my um, Cisco-based servers in my lab, you know, we test how much latency do I get machine to machine just going off of the top of the rack switch. I get about 25 microseconds, right? which is faster than a standard SSD, which is somewhere, if it's not DRAM supported, if it's actually hitting the NAND, uh, which is the memory inside the SSD, it's more like 80. Uh, microseconds, but with Optane, we can get you below 10. So now the network is a lot slower than the SSD. And you always got to ask, you should, somebody should ask me, like, what's the payload there? How big is the payload? Because just like driving a load of, of uh, groceries home, the payload always matters, right? You're going to get less gas mileage when you're taking five passengers as opposed to just yourself. All right, Sysbench. Uh, some of the history here, since I work with Dimitri and our own software solutions group, I've been able through you know, all the email things that we've, we discuss internally to understand where Sysbench has come. And I'll just give you a quick uh, history, the wiki history on this. Sysbench early on, 0.4, became very stable and very high performance. And then they wanted to make it scriptable. So 0.5 came out and it became a scriptable product, which is very useful, right? We want to be able to add our own scripts, uh, top queries or whatever for our own custom databases and not just Sysbench, which really helps me look at the value of that hardware. So that was valuable, but they slowed the product down, right? Scripting, you add scripts, it gets slower. So it took a while, but this guy, a very talented programmer, Alexi, worked at it and actually still has it scriptable and gives that flexibility, but the performance now with 1.0 around 109, it's 112 or 113, has a very high performance product. And this is validated by Dimitri, who uh, sits in Europe. He's the performance lead for MySQL at Oracle. So he's written that up. You can see that. Some of the tools we're going to show you tonight are HTOP. <clears throat> I like HTOP. It's going to show you some interesting things. We're not going to dig into every feature. Um, as opposed to TOP, it's kind of like a high fidelity version of TOP. But remember, these two tools, HTOP and TOP, when I interview people, I ask them, does it provide you storage statistics? Sometimes I get that blank stare. stare. <laughs> oh, yeah, it does. No, 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 it does not. HTOP and TOP don't tell you anything about storage, right? They tell you about the memory and the CPU and the usage of the top processes, right? Because that's where the real time is. The real time is in the memory and the CPU, but you got to see what's being fetched or flushed out to the disks. And those tools below help you with that. <clears throat> the, the most popular one is IOSTAT. I mean, every Linux and uh, Unix administrator, DevOps guys understands IOSTAT, and we'll look at that today. I use IOTOP sometimes, which shows me the threads that are actively using the device, and I can see balance across the threads, how many active threads I actually have uh, working against the, the storage device or the group of, or the array of devices. VMSTAT's a memory tool. It's been around. It's like the grandfather tool. been around forever and DSTAT, and DSTAT is very popular. Uh, a lot of guys in the Valley like it because it shows you all the resources and you kind of look across the resources to get a glimpse of where things are changing. So it gives you this array and you look across it. We built a graphical tool on top of DSTAT called the Intel Storage Snapshot. And if you just Google Intel Storage Snapshot, you can get that tool for free. And there's nothing, there's no gimmicks in there. You can just take it. It's HTML5. It's a collector, a bash script that collects for you it's as long as you've got DSTAT installed, which is a simple apt or a yum install. And with that, you can use this tool and create your own collections in house. You can put it on your Amazon cloud environment and use it as you wish. 
And finally, there's things inside MySQL, which we're not going to cover tonight. In fact, when we test MySQL, we turn the performance schema off. And there's about 150 different global status uh, parameters you can go look at, again, outside the scope of tonight's, uh, tonight's talk. So what did we do? Uh, nothing fancy here. This is guidance and leadership comes from Dmitry, uh, Dmitry Kravchuk. Uh, you can look him up. I can certainly help you with the spelling after the session. Um, he sits in, in Europe. Uh, OLTP, there's a number of different tests. You can just do a standard test on a device to see what, what the device can do from a performance standpoint to see if in your machine you can get the specs that the device is um, advertised with. Um, but you know, it gets a lot more interesting once you put real workload on there, and your, even your own database, of course, is the most interesting. But the OLTP test is a standard test that allows you to test one piece of hardware against another and just see how one server uh, or one change in the environment uh, tests out for. What we do is we put eight tables across 50 million rows. Um, Sysbench creates a very small uh, row, 200 bytes. And that equates to about 92 gigabytes on disk of a database. And then what we do is we starve that memory down below 20 gigabytes. Right? We could go even lower, but at about 19, 18 gigabytes, we see a pretty fantastic performance still, as long as we're backed by a really good SSD. Now, I want to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about Dimitri and the whole team at Oracle. Oracle has invested a lot of money into MySQL. Um, and this is really the first time in a very long time that the InnoDB engine has been re-architected. Sonny, who is the lead there, <coughs> created this famous patch to determine that there were some problems in MySQL and they needed to fix that. And so you can see there's some locking problems in the log buffer, which is how you instantiate the writes, right? Logs are for recovery. And you need to instantiate those logs and get those writes down as quickly as possible so you can release those locks and let others use those records. And now they've parallelized all this in MySQL 8. So there's a real improvement coming. Uh, again, better hardware will take advantage of that. Uh, another thing I want to mention is this Percona blog here at the bottom. What happened here is the Percona guys took their TPCC benchmark, which is a standalone tool. You know, you just fire it off TPCC. It, you download it from Percona. What they did is they realized Sysbench is flexible. Everybody's using Sysbench, or a vast majority of people are. Let's port that into Sysbench so you can run Sysbench with these changes. Um, Dimitri said, you'll find that these results are pretty stunning. And you can see the differences between TPCC, which is a different type of schema compared to what you're going to see tonight in the OLTP test. Because uh, the standard TPCC is a certain warehouse, an order taking schema, similar to an Amazon store type of environment. And that's a different test, and it's been designed differently. Uh, and so I recommend you try that out if, if uh, you're interested. So let's get to the demo. Before I get to the demo, is there any questions about what I just covered? you ask away if you want. <coughs> Can you, uh, is there any advice to making the SDD uh, like portable like a flash drive where you have um, a lap, you know, like a computer and then you just like buy a module and just kind of stick it in and it'll be... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're... I don't know, no, I don't think we have anything on the roadmap to actually make an Optane stick that you would carry around as a flash drive. I mean, you're limited by the interface there, right? They use this very small controller. In fact, even the Optane memory today is somewhat limited by the controller, even in these high-performance uh, computers. I, I guess the, the question would be, what are you trying to achieve? What, yeah, what are, you, what are you going after? What's the hope? Oh, or, Business goal. So then, like the next generation of computers mm -hmm. uh, will have interfaces where you can just stick in the, uh, your your ROM. So to so like DRAM, right? Now it'll be like you can just easily you know, upgrade to 
Okay. Make it more modular. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we are producing M.2 versions, right? So, I mean, there's a whole slew of form factors. Form factor is how you package the memory. Um, you know, it starts with M.2, which is like your pinky. It's a little 20 millimeter by 80 millimeter um, strip of PCB. And you put the controller on there, the M.2 interface. And that's how, like, this laptop's running on an M.2 version of an NVMe based. SSD. NVMe is a standard um, non-volatile memory express. Optane SSDs are NVMe based. They work in NV any NVMe based server. But it is a specification that's very lightweight to allow this memory to shine uh, and get as much of the data into the CPU as quickly as possible. So there's that form factor capability um, and where we can take that. Um, you know, there's ways of plugging it into the adjacencies like GPUs and to FPGAs. And certainly I think it's going to work its way into the mobile space at some point. But it's in the cloud today, and we're going to show that to you so you can use it there. Did you want to ask any more? I probably didn't answer totally what you wanted, but... Okay. Yeah, we sure, I'm not even sure what I'm talking about. That's okay. Don't worry about it. None of us know everything. That's for sure. So um, this is, when we say bare metal, what we mean is it's just the operating system, right? We had an, a vice president come in and she goes, what's bare metal? So I should explain. Bare metal, right? It's just a box with the operating system on it. It's actually arcane today because everybody uses containers and virtual machines. Why? Because our computers are so high powered, you can put so many of these workloads side by side. What that does is it drives random I.O. Because machine A and machine B are completely out of sync. But the hardware, all the hardware sees is these blocks coming at it, right? Give me a block, here's a block to write out, and it's all dramatically random. That's where the hard drive falls over, right? You can serve video, one video from your hard drive all day long and you're probably not going to see a glitch. It's going to be fine. Serving a video from a hard drive is a perfectly good idea. But when you have this workload sharing that I just described as the cloud is based on, you need to have something that can handle the randomization. And this SSDs broke through and really came through. Also, their controllers are high powered. So, you know, it used to be a time where a thousand IOPS used to drive the storage guy crazy. What? I got something eating a thousand IO operations. That's what an IO, IOP is. It's a read or a write from the drive at a certain size, right? So we use this term IOPS. A thousand used to be a lot. A thousand for an SSD today, it's like, give me 50 of those at a thousand IOPS each. I can handle that. You know, even hundreds of thousands of IOPS on a single device. There's devices out there, very, they're very specialized, that go to a million, right? So an Optane SSD gets you there, right? It gets you to a million really easily. So you have MySQL running over here. He's, this is this process table I described. And you, know, you have a lot of things just sitting there on the machine. But one of the things you want to recognize in HTOP is this thing that what's actually running. This is active stuff on the CPU. At that one second in time, I saw two things actually sitting in the CPU calculating something. They're not queued up, they're not sleeping, they're not waiting on disk, they're actually running. <clears throat> when we fire up this demo, it'll be on the same system, so there's no network here involved. We just run the workload, on the, which is Sysbench, he's the workload generator, and he functions against MySQL D, which is the, ser the system under test. Or we call it the server under test. And um, so they're all in the same system. We're not passing any information. These are the devices, right? So we do something called NVMe list. This is an open source path. Everything here is open source tonight, everything. Uh, and it's all open and written. The configuration file you can get from Dimitri. You can get it from me. But I, I encourage you to read Dimitri's stuff and get involved with what he knows. Uh, he's, you know, he's at the source, right? He's the source of the... Uh, the, the, co the code. NVMe list, right? These are all Intel devices. You'll never see Intel compare ourselves to any of the competitors. We just compare ourselves to the last generation of our drive and how we beat our own drive. <clears throat> and this is how big a block is. 
it's formatted at 512 byte. It could be 4096. In fact, 4096 is more the standard. Even hard drives can be formatted at 4096. But here, this is just what it ships with. And then this is the firmware. I haven't talked much about firmware, but that's the brains inside the controller of the SSD. And it provides really the, that's the gold, right? That's what we have so many programmers providing ultimate stability without sacrificing performance uh, with, uh, with the SSDs. In fact, one of the things that really pushed us to 3D Crosspoint and Optane SSDs is that it's a real headache to manage the media on a NAND SSD. And it's less so with this new media. So it, it allows us to, one, create a more stable product, deliver it faster, and hire less developers to do the work. And benefits translate to more stable product for you as the user. So we're going to look at something called IOSTAT. And now, but first, let's fire up the uh, workload. By the way, this is, um, this is our latest generation processor. Intel uses bronze, gold, platinum. This is not platinum. This is not the top of the world uh, skew or anything like that. It's just a gold processor that has a base frequency of 3 gigahertz. But when we run, we actually are built the server in performance mode. We have lots of blogs and papers about how to do that. You set it up in performance mode, you get more performance out of the system for the same price that you paid. And this 3 gigahertz processor actually throttles up to about 3.7 gigahertz. The faster the clock of the CPUs, and there's many of them, each core is a CPU, the more you're going to drive that storage and the more effective that Optane SSD is going to be. So anytime people ask me, what should I buy? I always tell them, buy the highest clock speed you can because it's going to give you the best performance against that SSD. So let's... Right. When we, so a little, tiny little story quickly. Um, you know, we did all of our initial specs and delivering those specs on a workstation, on a, like a Core i7. And then we moved it to the servers. But just like little fast cars are better than big F-150s, the server is like an F-150. So it's a, little it's a little harder to get that performance out of that bigger server. But that bigger server can still do more workload. It's just the clock, right? You can actually drive the response time faster. Yeah, the question is, how much does it have to wait for the memory? That depends on factors, right? Like, is the software creating a bottleneck where it has to wait? Assuming nothing in the software is doing it, it will generate things more quickly. You'll get more workload out of a faster CPU. Number prompting, like Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm interested to know if I'm running a, a CPU at the about 4 gig or like 4.2 or even more. Mm -hmm. So, if you go on 10 memory, how much the CPU have to wait to get the numbers to get right. the data in? Yeah, yeah. So, it's the I.O. weight will be lower with an Optane memory because it responds faster. Do you have a, a, like an estimate what the ballpark? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'll give you a ballpark. We recommend at least a 2.5 gigahertz CPU with an Optane with an Optane SSD. We think it your your you know your not, not that it wouldn't work right it'll still work it just won't work as as well as so with if a two point. It's about four gig. Mm -hmm. How much does it have to wait? So it doesn't wait at all. Yeah, it, it it's a complicated question. It depends. If a single thread won't wait at all. Yeah, yeah. The weight is generated by things working in. Unison and not getting responded properly. And and if you have f four threads running with a queued up to four, there won't be any weight. There won't be any weight. See, remember when the clock speed goes down, you actually the response time of the whole system slows down. It's like a heartbeat, right? Frank, will they be able to try it in the hands-on lab? Maybe he can uh, tune the tune the CPU. No, we don't have that in the demo, but. You could certainly do it. I have a, I have a, by the way, I can send you our, our Linux or Windows or VMware performance evaluation guide, which goes into this a little bit more. But let's get going with the rest of the demo. So wow, look at that. It's not blank anymore. Um, we have a lot, of, um, a lot of CPUs 
firing up. So it's actually firing up. It's not in a steady state yet. It has to start doing right. And what you just saw was the, the shift downward in the workload um, in the CPU's busyness, right? The CPU's, all this black space over here on the right could be used, right? It could be cranking at 90 or 100 percent. What's actually going on is that, you know, there's locks going on in the redo that I showed you. Uh, there's some slowness in the SSD as well, right? Even though this is a high-powered SSD, it's an NVMe NAND-based SSD. There's four terabyte one here, and these 750s are um, Optane's. What you'll see is, um, and I'll show you. We'll read, we'll read IOSTAT real quick. You read IOSTAT like you read Mandarin. You read from the right to the left. So the CPUs, the, the CPU inside the SSD, the controller, or the ASIC, all the same thing. It's, there's a controller inside the SSD. He's 100% busy servicing things right now. Right? And that service time and average wait time add to about 60 microseconds. It's still great performance, but there's wait going on, right? We're actually queuing. This is the average queue size. There's 13 requests queued into the device. We have a queue. Queue is not good, right? Queue means I'm waiting, just like you're waiting to check out at the grocery store, right? So, yeah. Is this running on the Optane or M.2? No, this is running on a NAND-based SSD. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. This is a NAND SSD. You would see that with any NAND SSD. This is an Intel P4500 NAND SSD, right? And it's just not servicing the request fast enough on a 70, 30, 30 workload, right? And at the same token, we're, we're losing some of that performance, right? We're losing some of that performance. There's, you're not able to get all of those CPUs busy. Another thing here is the IO weight. 12% of the system is being wasted with IO weight, right? Can we get that down? Can we eliminate it, right? with a better SSD, and therefore get more transactions, or more containers, and run more on a single server with less space, less power, all that good stuff. So this is the key thing. Um, we're going to then run on an Optane SSD. You're going to see the difference. Let's have a time check. I need a couple. I mean, I'm, I'm almost done. I'm going to just show the Optane now. Any other questions? Are you good? So actually, you can see how, where the, take a look. So that we could show the CPU. See, these, this is, I just ran a little Linux command. The CPUs are running at 3.7 gigahertz. So the base speed is 3 gigahertz. It's coming from a table in Linux called ProcInfo. And it's showing you all those CPU cores are running at 3.7 gigahertz right now. Right? Every one of them, constantly which is good, right? It's what you paid for. It's what you want to get out of the system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Thanks for, thanks for the feedback. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I can do it on, on HTOP. It's probably running pretty good. Okay, this is going to finish up here in a minute or so. And, you know, we're going to get a certain amount of throughput, right? This is the throughput that you see, the number of writes, the number of reads, how many transactions we got, right? A database transaction is probably a set of queries. I do a bunch of warehouse checks to make sure I got the goods in stock. I do a credit check against the user, and I start updating things and actually posting an order just like Every, all the behind the scenes stuff the, to your Amazon experience, right? And not that this is a perfect representation of that, but it tries to represent that to, at, some, at some level. Um, and, you know, the key thing is, is what is the number of transactions or what are the number of orders that I placed? So now it's finishing up. It's flushing out the I.O. and it's cleaning up these threads and you're going down to a lower number of running, div running uh, processes. One thing I didn't point out in this benchmark is these running processes, even though I have 72 virtual threads 
virtual hardware threads, right? 36 cores, hyper-threaded to 72. Um, the running count was never really at 72. We were at 30 or 40. Things were blocking. Things were not running as well as they could be. Now, let's run demo two. And I'm stopping my SQL and I'm bringing up the Optane version of the same exact database. Um, all the same things. I can obviously share all the code or whatever. And now this is going to fire up. And you're going to see um, a different experience. So you see those CPUs really pushing harder now. And look at the running total. We're actually at 72 or higher, we have one user connection for every user. I'm pushing 72 user connections. But there's MySQL backend processing as well. So we should be able to push higher than 72. And we're doing it. And you can see now at a sustained level, my CPUs are much higher. Right? Now you're saying, Frank, how come you're not getting me to 100%? Well, talk to Dimitri and the team at MySQL, right? They're still working on the redo locks and they're working on things that, you know, slow MySQL down. It's not that simple to make the software so, uh, so freely threaded. But if you ran an all read test, this would be all the way over at 100%. Because with all reads, it's not a big deal. You don't have to trust me on that. You can run what's known as the point select benchmark. So let's go over and look at what the Optane is doing. Is the Optane even fully busy? No, with 72 threads, which is a lot of cores, right? It's a lot of cores. You know, you, most of the guys that buy a workstation, it's a four core product or something like that. I got 72 in this system. This thing, 72 cores, the Optane's only half busy. It says, where's the other 72 cores? I need 144. My service time is at 10 microseconds, and my queue size is really low, too. Hey, he's servicing 72 users. He still has to queue a little bit. But the Optane is no longer a bottleneck. And when you knock out storage and network bottlenecks, you're a hero at work because those are massive gains. And you're feeding the CPU at the same time. So you're knocking out a terrible bottleneck. You want to be CPU bottlenecked. That's your goal. What about that IO8? Well, Frank, you didn't get me to zero, but I got you to 1%. Because I'm queuing a little bit, right? So you're going to see some IO8. If there was no queue, you wouldn't see any IO8. But 72 threads, this busy. It's the fastest SSD in the world right here. So I'm going to hand it over to Justin now. All right. Can you guys hear me OK? Yep. All right, so we're going to jump into the demo here in a second. And hopefully, all of you who want to get on the guest internet were able to. If not, well, raise your hand, and Andrew or someone can help you uh, jump on there. But uh, so <clears throat> we spent the last week or so hacking together this demo, and uh, we actually ran it by Intel security, uh, uh, application security, and we're going to expose you to uh, a terminal here. And so uh, we ran it by them, and they, um, they some alarms went off. You know that we were exposing too much. So we're only turning the server on for tonight, and then uh, you know a few hours we'll shut it down. But you can play around uh, as we jump on, and uh, and just the only thing is try not to take too much RAM when you run your benchmarks because uh, you'll be sharing with with everybody. So um, yeah, so this is the hands-on, and uh, I'm going to share what we're going to be using tonight in terms of a system. So our system is an IBM SoftLayer Cloud bare metal server that's publicly available. And it's a dual Intel Xeon with 28 cores or 56 hyperthreaded cores. It's got 128 gigs of RAM and a 375 gig Optane SSD. And on top of that, we, we've placed Docker. And so you're going to be able to access the Docker containers over HTTP and WebSockets. And um, that's why we're recommending to use Chrome, which is compatible with this um, implementation right now. Each container has its own MySQL and Datadur over, over, uh, over Overlay 2, which is the file system. And they're, they're all running on Optane. 
And we're also providing a benchmarking script, which is basically a wrapper around Sysbench, which is essentially what Frank was doing. So we're taking, you know, Frank was running 72 cores, 256 gigabytes, right, all one big bare metal machine. Um, and we're kind of flipping it to containerized uh, two gigabyte machines, something that um, a lot of uh, people running MySQL will run those type of workloads. Um, and so the lab, the benchmarking script, um, which you'll be able to run, it runs without switches. And it prompts for the InnoDB buffer pool size in megabytes. And that's where I'm asking you to put it at 2048. I didn't script in any checks, so you could put it at 128 gigs and kill us all. Um, so don't do that, please. Uh, but this is basically the DRAM pool, right? Um, you can set the number of tables. Uh, and also the max, the number of rows per table when Sysbench creates the, the database. Um, again, those limits are just because we have a 375 gig disk, and we want to make sure everyone is able to, to use it. Uh, the number of threads as well we can set, and then the test time. And we'll run about a five minute test. And we'll run the first run with uh, two gigs, or 248 megabytes of DRAM. Um, and our database that we'll create will be about 1.7 gigs. So we'll actually envelope the entire database in DRAM. And then our second run will reduce the DRAM to 256 megabytes, so eight times lower. And this will force uh, more of the uh, you know, activity onto Optane. And we'll see, basically, we're kind of doing a comparison, Optane versus DRAM, right? And the outputs of this file will be the P99 latency in milliseconds. Um, and you, if you look at the log files, you'll see more, but these are the ones that we're going to focus on. Um, and then the transactions per second, the cost per year of Optane and DRAM combined for that given configuration, and then the, um, the transactions per second per dollar. So how efficiently are you spending your dollars uh, to get that kind of throughput? Now, the, the first one will focus on um, the latency focuses on the end user experience, and then the next three focus a lot on cost for your system. OK, um, so with that, uh, go ahead and fire up uh, Google Chrome. And you can hop on to this IP address. And I'll do the same as well. So if there's some of you without laptops can see what's going on. Do it from our phones? You can try to do it from your phones. <laughs> I, I don't know how well it'll look, but you can try. Sure. Yeah. OK, um, so what I'll do is I'll do this as well. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to all kick off a MySQL benchmark, and we're going to use the default settings first, which will be the two gigs. OK, there we go. Um, all right, so uh, you know, go ahead and uh, oops. Go ahead and uh, fire up the script, and it'll take about 10 seconds to start. OK, so you'll get the, your, cho your uh, choice of how much DRAM you want to allocate to the uh, an ODB buffer pool size. So go ahead and hit Enter on the 10, uh, 2048. Um, and then uh, we'll do eight tables, and we'll do a million rows per table. Uh, one, th one thread, and then 300 seconds will be our test time. So if we go ahead and hit uh, go, um, this will first generate the database. Uh, so it'll build the test database. And then we're going to be about 1.7 to 1.8 gigs, somewhere in there. And then it'll run th the benchmark. Okay, And what I can do here is um, I can bring up Docker stats, and we can see all of them running. Yeah, I'll remove that. OK, so it looks like we got about 12 running. And if, some, if people want, they can open up a s more tabs and fire off more. We can get up to uh, 30 or 40 of these running. I, I've benchmarked it with up to 43. So um, feel free to fire up some more, um, more. And we'll check back on this in a second. So while that's running, like I said, it'll take about three minutes to build the database, and then about um, uh, five minutes to, to run the benchmark. 
So I want to talk about the, the outputs that we're looking at today. Uh, so the first one is the P99 tail latency. Now this is a big challenge um, for a lot of different companies. And they've written white papers uh, and talked about it at various conferences. So uh, Facebook talks about tail latency. Uh, managing tail latency of requests has become one of the primary challenges for large scale internet services. Uh, Google says at scale you can't ignore tail latency. And you can think about this in terms of, uh, you know, if you have, a, let's say, 50% of your, let's use a database as an example, in DRAM, and the rest get disk, when you have a cache miss, that's when you're hitting these, those P99 tail latencies, right? You're, go, you're missing the DRAM, and you're having to hit disk. And if it's a slow disk, your, your tail latency is going to be very high. Uh, Twitter, as well, talks about, not only talk about P99, but they also talk about 3.9 latency as causing them issues and them trying to address that. LinkedIn as well. Uh, they talk about long tail latencies affect members every day and improving their responsiveness even at the 99th percentile is critical to members' experience. And then MIT has an you know, academic paper on the subject as well. So that's one of the things we want to focus on and it's one of the things that Optane can drastically reduce. Um, in general, to define it, uh, P99 tail latency is the upper bound of latencies experienced by 99% of requests. And these can be SQL requests for a SQL query HTTP requests, network latency, but remember they're all additive, right? So if you say anywhere you save latency, helps your system. A, a great talk on this is by uh, Gil Teen, how not to measure latency. So even in the SSD world, a lot of times we're quoting mean latency or networks we quote, quote mean or median latency. Uh, this is a terrible way to quote latency because. Um, if, if you do the math and you watch this video, something like 0.00005% of page views experience median latency. Most page views experience something much higher. And the reason for that is because a modern web service will make 100 different requests for a given uh, page, for example. And so if you have 100 page requests, 63% of the users will experience P99 latency from somewhere in the system. That's why this is so important. Um, and now why it's important that if they're experiencing this is because it impacts the user experience. So you know, Amazon's done studies. Every 100 milliseconds of delay costs them 1% of sales. And Google found that a half second delay in search generation can cause revenue to drop by 20%. So these are real important to end users is that speed and that performance. Uh, we do have an upcoming Intel webinar in June, uh, dramatically lower P99 tail latency with Intel Optane. So you can find out more there. Um, so let's see. Let's jump back over and see how our benchmarking is doing. Has anyone's completed yet? No? no? OK. Uh, we, can, we can take a peek at the, uh, the Docker here. Uh, I'll try and increase the font size. So this is Docker stats. And you can see here, uh, you know, most of these um, are running at about two gig. This CA advisor is a um, a dashboard, so it's not actually running the script. But you can see we got everything running at about two gigs, and then you got the single thread and some other processes that Docker's running to keep the container going. So we'll check back in a second and see uh, when that finishes. Okay. So now I want to talk about the the second. Um, metric, which is transactions per second. So this is a cost driver, right? So for example, if you're Amazon and you need a max throughput of a million transactions per second to handle traffic spikes, say, you know, Cyber Monday, Black Friday, so you want to provision enough to be able to handle those traffic spikes. The more efficiently a system provides this throughput, the less resources and cost is required, right? And so um, this benchmarking strip will calculate the transactions per second and the cost. and you, uh, and then you can see that using various levels of DRAM versus Optane, right? And I, uh, the calculator within the script is using pricing based on IBM's software cloud uh, pricing. So it's actually this server's price. And so I divided that out to get the DRAM cost of about $4.84 a month for each gig of DRAM. And then the Optane price of about $1.11 uh, per gigabyte per month. And what you'll see is uh, pay attention to, because we're, this first run, we're all in DRAM, right? The entire database can run in DRAM, so we've got two gigs. And then the second run, we're going to cut the DRAM to 256 megabytes, run again, and you're going to see um, uh, how the cost differences and the, the transaction costs per dollar uh, are affected. Okay. 
Um, so let's go back and see how we're doing here. What happened? Okay, so it looks like we're still running. Let's jump over here. Yeah, so it's still running. Um, has anyone's finished yet? Okay. What, what did you get for, let's say, transactions per second? Five hundred and three. Okay. Five ninety one. Okay. Yeah, and uh, it looks like uh, this one finishes well, and we are at uh, four hundred ninety five. So we're kind of in the four nineties to five ten range, something like that. Uh, latency you can see is three milliseconds. The P ninety nine, so extremely low latency. And um, actually, let me let me zoom out just a little bit so you can see all this on. Well, it didn't change it. Okay, that's okay. Um, and we have the transactions per dollar, uh, and those aren't going to show up real well, but that's okay. I can get them from the, the script. So as these, uh, it looks like almost everyone's kind of wrapping up here. Maybe we have about three more. So I have a script that will collect all of the results. Let's see here. So. If I go to my Docker area, I wrote a script that'll pull everyone's results from, um, yeah, from their log files. Okay, so you can see here. Ah, someone cheated. Someone wrote uh, used twelve tables. Who is that? <laughs> Who's that guy? That's you. All right. <laughs> He's pushing the limits here. He's trying to break us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll do a third run, and you can try and break us. How about that? Um, yeah, so you can see all the late, the, trans, the transactions are about you know five ten to four ninety with the latency of about two or three here. You can see. Th Zoom in a little bit. Yeah. Problem is, it goes to the next line, and then it starts to be hard to read. But we'll see. Okay. Um, you can see the the cost per year. This is of the combined cost of having that level of system for a whole year, and then the the, tra the transactions per second per dollar. And these will make sense once we run the, the second run and get a comparison. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, let's, let's go ahead and fire up the second run. So just uh, run the script again. But this time, only do 256 um, megabytes of RAM and everything else the same. Do the 12 tables, because uh, the script will you, it'll reuse the exact same database. And you'll get an apples to apples. Yeah. Okay, 256, 8, a million, one thread, 300 seconds. And this time it'll, it'll run faster because it's going to reuse the exact same database as before. So anyone have any questions at, while it runs? So what are the size range of top 10 tables? Like, what are the size range of top 10 tables? That's a good, great question. In the market today, we have 375 gig and 750. Uh, so OEMs have those today, and I've certified those. But we're Planning for a range from about 100 gigabytes up to one and a half terabytes on a single drive. And of course, you can raid them. The smaller one, what's the price on that? <coughs> yeah, the, the price is about the same. It's about $3 per gigabyte um, that you see on Amazon. You can go to Amazon today and look up a P4800X. They're about $3. So. And the smaller ones, they tend to be the M.2 sticks. There are people who are actually displacing DRAM, right? They have the ability to you know, take out some of their DRAM and put these in, do a storage engine opportunity to displace DRAM. That's what we're showing you today. You can even do Linux paging, Linux swap, right? And swap actually, it's never been good, but now with this type of memory, it is relatively good, especially for containers or VMs. What is the price we could do that? I don't think he has both. Yeah, it's about 50 cents a gig on Amazon. I'll say the Amazon pricing or New Egg pricing. About 50 cents a gig for a low end um, endurance NVMe drive, 50 cents versus three dollars. But DRAM runs, server DRAM runs north of ten dollars. So we're in the middle there, right? Yeah, and I think yeah, and I think that's the key that we're kind of trying to point out here is. 
you know, you have your SSDs, right? And you have your DRAM, and Optane can be thought of as a, a replacement for DRAM, right? And so it's, it's good to compare that pricing in addition to if you're looking at the SSD, the NAND-based SSD pricing. And that's what we're trying, uh, that's, I think, right here we're going to see that, you know, you can lower your DRAM, save money, and still see pretty similar performance. All right, let's... Temp drive. I mean, you're not going to replace all your NAND. It's not going to happen. So you have to think differently, right? Is it, can I use it as a temp drive to make my analytics run faster? And that's what we've seen. We see financial companies transforming the data on Optane more quickly, pulling the workload out of their SAN. They're very expensive sandboxes that they paid five, six dollars a gig with. They found the three dollar a gig Optane cheaper. It was cheaper than what they were spending. In their case, it was temporary data. And so they didn't even have to raid those things because they knew how to restart things. But the Optane's increased the workload through like two to three times. And that's huge, right? I mean, typically every generation until processor gives you 20%, not 2x, 3x, like we're talking. Do you think Oracle We've done some work on Oracle. Um, you know, what we're seeing, because a lot of people that run Oracle run them in some kind of uh, NVMe appliance. So there's the opportunity to modernize your Oracle environment, use hot table spaces on Optane, get the leverage of those appliances. Most people don't run Oracle on direct attached. So you know we do the partnerships there. Or you run it virtualized on like a vSAN appliance, where Optane runs as a, a write cache, a very effective write cache. Again, feeding those VMs the data faster, you get higher quality VMs and more of them. Is that process transparent? Like the software to make an Optane drive as a write cache to any, uh, any other block device behind it. Uh, is, do we have like software for that, like kernel modules for that? Yeah, like so VMware sells, I'll just pick on VMware. VMware use, has vSAN, which is their, because they virtualize memory and CPUs first. That's how virtualization started, right? The storage was still a SAN, right? right? That's how you plug in, you still plug into a SAN. That's not virtualized, we know that. But now they've got vSAN, virtualized SAN. And so this is that converged stack of software that can leverage Optane as a high performance write cache with a cheaper backing store of NAND. So it's a, you know, it's a tiering model. When we say cache, it could be a tier, but in this case, it's a temporary write cache that you're flushing from the Optane more quickly. Okay. That, that so the software's there, it's yeah. part of vSAN. So that, that storage like, as a separate device altogether, but but let's say we have like a RAID array with like 20 derivatives of this, this data. And in, I mean, there, is there a kernel module that we can use today to stick this um, Optane memory module as a cache for that data? Right? Yes, right. So we have a product called Cache Acceleration Software. If you tie that software to an Intel device, it's absolutely free. Okay. If you're a software development shop and want to see the source code, you call me, we'll give you the source code to look at and utilize. It's a wrapper-based product, right? So it's a layered product. You could build your own wrapper for your own virtualized virtualization environment. So you could do it as you wish with it. And we have cloud providers, the biggest in the world, using that product. And we've given them the source code. Could you use it against the you know, Samsung or Western Digital? You could, but you'd have to pay us a little bit, a little bit per drive. In, in, in the, one of the major problems with um, SSDs is uh, write amplification, like lifetime of the SSDs. Uh, in terms of li lifetime expectancy guarantees, how does it come? How does Optane basis compare the regular NAND SSD? Yes, that's a great question. So actually, a NAND SSD runs at about one drive write per day, right? So if it's a one terabyte drive, you could write it one terabyte on the drive per day. That's a typical standard. The NAND Optane drive is 30 drive writes per day, so 30x more endurance than than uh, than a typical NAND SSD. 30x more over one period of time. Over five years. Over five years. Yeah, all of our drives are guaranteed for five years. Warranty for five years. In all cases, all data center products. Yeah. We can go higher. It's actually, uh, there's a high cost for Intel engineering and quality and reliability to test the 30. Yeah. We're thinking from a memory displacement standpoint, we can go to higher than 30. So 
this cache accelerator software is not just available for uh, uh, obtaining SSDs. Uh, is it available for regular? Yes. 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 If it's mostly a read cache, you might want to use a NAND based SSD. It may yeah. perfectly suffice, right? It's when you have a high mix of reads and writes that Optane will outperform. And you can see there's always some caching ratio that you have, right? 3% of my backing store, right? Or 15%. We see in the tests that we've run, and we've got white papers we can share with you, and we can lower that caching ratio. So you don't have to over-provision the drive. You can use lower cache ratios, and you improve the service quality of the product, probably delivering business value to, the, to your end users. All of that factors into potentially lower cost. All right, so it looks like most of the, actually all of the runs are done. Um, you can see here the CPUs are uh, pretty idle. So let me, uh, let's see, let's go back to the browser. And you can see here, um, we got the two runs, uh, with one with the two gigs of, of DRAM and the one with the 256 megabytes. Same table, same rows, same 1.6 gig uh, database. You can see the transactions per second are actually pretty close, right? You got all DRAM at around 495, and then a mix of uh, t uh, then drastically less DRAM with Optane at around 463. Uh, same with the tail latency. Actually, in, in my case, the tail latency was actually slightly faster with Optane. That's probably other factors, but you know, it's basically they're neck and neck, so no impact on the tail latency. And then the cost per year of the first system is $138 versus $36. And so if we you know, factor in the ratios with the higher being better, you can see that a lower DRAM with Optane uh, gives you a higher uh, transaction per second per dollar. Right? So if you need to, back to the Amazon case, if they need to provision a certain throughput, it would be more efficiently uh, and cost effective to use, to use um, less DRAM and use Optane. How about anyone else? Did anyone else get anything interesting? With bigger the size, the cost ratio has changed like 3.37 to 9.37. Okay. The size of it goes up when the cost comes down. Yeah. Uh, let's, let me, let me uh, let's see. We'll be able to see your results easily because you use, here's your run, right? This is the, two, the 12 tables. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it looked like what happened was, uh, let's see here. Um, uh, you, you're using more, um, your costs are higher, right? So your dollars per year uh, on both systems are higher because you need more, you have a larger database, right? Your database is uh, 2.5 gig versus 1.7. So there's an extra cost there per year to have the Optane um, memory. So that's part of it. And then it, looks, it looks, to look, looks like your performance is right in line. So you got about 495 for um, transactions per second on the all DRAM. A based one, and then 449 on the you know the low low DRAM one. So your your results are in line, um, but there is a little bit of cost difference, and and that's why. So now that we're done with this, we've looked at this. You can play on your own, um, and if you want, you can we can push things higher. You go to three, four threads, you know, um, push the DRAM higher, or take the DRAM to zero. I don't uh, think it'll completely zero out because there's some um, other little cache buffers and stuff. But you can take it to zero and try it out, um, or anything you want. So um, that's what kind of the rest of the uh, the rest of the time here is about: is just discussion, trying things out. You can push it to the max. Um, we also you, you're welcome to share your findings. Uh, if you want to tweet about it, you can you know share about what you what you learned, um, so that other people can kind of know in the community what they're learning. And um, yeah, so feel free to try and break it. Uh, if you want, we can kick off. You want to kick off another run? Go a little bit higher, a little bit harder. Doing good, huh, Justin? You got this thing stable like 10 hours ago. Yeah, yeah, I did. It was it was 2 a.m. and all of a sudden it got stable. So. <laughs> no, I, I'm just you, feel free to play on your own. But I think Andrew is going to come up and just talk a little bit more about um, some of the community opportunities. Yeah, so just want to let you know, so as you saw today earlier, you used an IBM cloud server. Those are publicly available today. You can get access to opt-in yourself and try it out with whatever configuration you want. 
Um, if you're testing anything out in, in Europe, you can get access with OVH.com. And we're working on getting more and more access to, the, to these uh, SSDs for you to try out further. One other thing I want to tell you about, preview a little bit of a teaser here, is that we're, uh, we're looking for projects that want to test uh, your open source um, MySQL or other database use case. Um, and we're, we're going to be launching a small uh, lab of servers over at Packet, another bare metal service provider, um, coming shortly. And I'm looking for people who are in this community who want to try it out and come talk about their, what they learn in, the, in future meetups and things like that. So we're looking to find people who want to, want to test this even further. So you have access to the, the little demo tonight, uh, but we're going to have something more stable going, going in the near future. So if you're interested, uh, send me a note. That's my contact information. I've got my cards as well if you need. And then uh, you saw the, the Twitter link. If you, if you tweet on there, I can find you as well and send you more information when we have that. But we plan to have a Slack channel where you can come in and, and talk about or ask more questions and obviously request resources to servers in the future. So um, if you have any questions, let me know. That's, that's it. So keep, keep playing. And uh, we're here to answer any, any more questions. There's more food, too, as well, if you want. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much. Yeah.